Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Good evening, and welcome to another edition of The Glories of Mary. I'm your host, Jason Brunel, and I will be taking you throughout the hour from 8 o'clock till 9 o'clock p.m. Uh, on this Thursday evening. Um, to discuss the truths uh, regarding the Blessed Virgin Mary, our spiritual mother, the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ. But before we begin the show, let us take a moment to enter into our, enter into prayer, to recollect ourselves, and to ask the Holy Spirit to come upon us and to silence all of the noise of the day, silence our minds, our concerns, our anxieties, our sadness, our frustrations, come Holy Spirit, replace the tension within us with a holy relaxation, replace the turbulence within us the sacred calm. Replace the darkness within us with your day. Replace the winter within us with your spring. Straighten our crookedness. Fill our emptiness. Dull the edge of our pride. Sharpen the edge of our humility. Light the fires of our love. Quench the flames of our lust. Help us to see ourselves as you see us, that we might be fortunate according to your word. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Amen. Holy Mother Mary, we turn to you now, having communicated with your divine spouse, most holy spirit of God, the spirit of the Father and the Son, the very love of God himself. And knowing that you have taken the Holy Spirit as your divine spouse, or knowing that you have accepted the the proposal of the Holy Spirit, knowing that from the great St. Maximilian Kolbe that you are, that the Holy Spirit quasi-incarnated himself in you, that you were so full of grace, that you are the quasi-incarnation of the Holy Spirit. Um, we pray that you, as the dispensatrix and mediatrix of all graces, of every single grace that comes to us from God, as it passes through your hands and from your immaculate heart, and, and knowing that every grace comes to us through your willed intercession and it is therefore also not only a gift from God, but also a gift from you as well as our spiritual mother. Obtain for us such a superabundant outpouring of your divine spouse, the Holy Spirit, particularly in the the, the gifts of knowledge and wisdom and understanding this evening as we pour over these pages, as we read these books and these articles having to do with your prerogatives and the incredible roles that the Most Holy Trinity has entrusted to you as a, help us to penetrate these truths 
And may it clarify any confusion in our minds regarding your role as our mediator with as our mediatrix with the with the sole mediator uh, between the Father and humanity, who is Jesus Christ, your well beloved Son, your divine Son, the incarnate Word, who received the fullness of His immaculate human nature from you. You who were and who are and who forever shall be immaculate, conceived without the least stain of original sin. And we ask all of this through your all-powerful, never-failing intercession in the most holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who brings us to you that we might love him most perfectly through, with, and in your Immaculate Heart, with the very love of your own Immaculate Heart, with the perfect faith of your contemplation, with the perfect hope of your trust, we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of Peace, pray for us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Joseph, pray for us. I thank you for praying with me this evening. Tonight's show is going to be devoted to studying the second greatest doctrine regarding the Blessed Virgin Mary. As we spoke last week regarding the most significant prerogative of Our Lady, which is her uh, divine motherhood, her divine maternity, um, Mary having been chosen to having been chosen to give birth uh, to the God-man, Um, what what a tremendous reality! These 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 these, these that's the incredible thing uh, when it comes to theology. When it comes to studying these truths of the faith, they, every one of them it, they they are mysteries. They are the mysteries of the faith, the mysteries of our sacred beloved faith. And we can understand them to a certain extent. Um, actually, St. Thomas Aquinas really provides the best explanation of how it is that we talk about God and these, all of these incredible mysteries of the faith. It's, it's hard enough to talk about natural mysteries, uh, those things pertaining to the reality, uh, the realities of physics and, and, and quantum mechanics and, and what have you. Um, and now we have these, uh, these quantum computers and, and just it's things that are beyond our ability to even wrap our minds around. Um, but then... It's it's almost it's almost I almost I almost said it, say to myself well how dare how dare I even think that I could begin to understand these mysteries but on the other hand it would be how 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 horrible would it be were we to uh, based on that line of thinking. Uh, cease to think about God. So on the one hand, uh, we realize our, inc- our, our, our incredible limitations and the, the smallness, the smallness of our minds, the smallness of who we are. And on the other hand, we realize that if we don't meditate on these truths of the faith, if we don't enter into communication with with our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, if we don't communicate with God, if we don't ponder the sacred mysteries 
by which we were saved, um, that that we will die spiritually. We will experience a spiritual death and become one of the countless living corpses. Our world is in such a state of disarray, confusion, and there are many people who are biologically alive but spiritually dead. And that's a very frightening reality. Um, Thus, what a tremendous responsibility each and every one of us has to not only do everything in our power to save ourselves, to, to work out our own salvation, but knowing that we are called to love our brothers and sisters, uh, well, firstly, uh, in, in, according to the old dispensation, according to the old law, to love God with our whole heart, soul, strength, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And then, of course, with the new law, the new covenant in the most precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, ratified in the blood of Christ, um, we are called to lay down our lives for our friends. No, greater love no man has than this than to lay down his life for his friends. And that is precisely what our Lord did. He said, I, as he himself said, I, I do not call you slaves. Uh, I call you friends because a slave doesn't know what his master is about. I have shared, Jesus has shared everything with us. He has, he has revealed the truth, the, truth, the truths regarding God in his very essence and nature. Uh, Jesus Christ has revealed the, the, the coming, the very, the very coming of our Lord Jesus and his three-year ministry of preaching and teaching and healing um, with, with his teachings, his words, and his deeds. Our Lord brings to fulfillment and brings to a culmination the divine revelation of God the Father. So the Father slowly but surely revealed himself to humanity throughout the entire course of the 4,000 year history of the Israelites. And then at the fullness of time, in the fullness of time, when Christ came, according to St. Paul, God sent his son, having sent myriad priests and prophets and kings, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, who was all three, the ultimate priest, the one high priest, uh, the, great, the greatest of all prophets, and the eternal king the king of the cosmos, the king of all hearts, Jesus Christ, who reveals the fullness of the truth of God to humanity. Um, So today we are studying the immaculate conception of Our Lady. Last week we studied Our Lady's divine maternity and how that really is the foundation for all of the subsequent uh, mariological truths, um, this incredible vocation, Our Lady, from all eternity, had been chosen by God to be the mother of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to be the Theotokos, the God-bearer, to give the second person of the Most Holy Trinity, his divine, I'm I'm sorry, to give the the, the the divine person, uh, uh, to give the divine person and to give the second person of the Most Holy Trinity his immaculate human nature. As we know, Jesus is one divine person with two natures a human nature, and a divine nature. And he receives the fullness of his immaculate and human nature from his immaculate and human mother, Mary. 
And so that is uh, something we're going to be discussing to, to a certain extent today. Um, and I'm going to be using as a guide a marvelous book written by Dr. Mark Miravalli, who is Professor of Muriology at Franciscan University of Steubenville in Ohio, Steubenville, Ohio. And this book is called Introduction to Mary, The Heart of Marian Doctrine and Devotion. I recommend this book to anyone who would like to better understand, um, to really, really enter into uh, an understanding of, of the authentically Catholic understanding of Mary. Um, Miravalli does a marvelous job of assembling all of the most critical elements of, 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 of Mariology as it pertains to Roman Catholic um, theology. And, and everything is so beautifully explained and so articulate. And um, it's just very, very well done. So we'll be drawing heavily from that uh, book. And also, we will be drawing from heavily from the, uh, from the document uh, that was issued in 18, uh, December 8, uh, 1854, uh, by Pope Pius uh, the uh, Ninth, Ineffabilis Deus, which is the uh, document uh, whereby the dogma of the Immaculate Conception is officially dogmatically defined via solemn um, proclamation of the extraordinary magisterium. So we have a an ex cathedra uh, from the chair papal uh, dogmatic definition of Mary as the immaculate conception uh, that she was indeed immaculately conceived. And um, you know what? I think that that's a good way to start the show. Let's start with the with the actual definition. The definition. So we have this document. Now, some people might be surprised to hear that uh, this was dogmatically defined um, via a document that was issued on December 8th, uh, which is the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. We celebrate the Feast of the Immaculate Conception on December 8th uh, in 1854. 1854 was not that long ago in the grand scheme of things. It was like yesterday. Um, so uh, people might be very surprised, but what must be understood is that the truth regarding Mary's role as having been immaculately conceived um, has been literally uh, in the minds of faithful Christians since the earliest days of the church. We have, uh, and I will go through the patristics, the, the early church fathers, many of whom were referring to the Blessed Virgin Mary as all pure, uh, without the least stain of sin, um, uh, untouched by original sin. You have these beautiful um, patristic um, statements regarding Our Lady's immaculate purity and her, her, her really her immaculate conception. And let's clear up something really from the, from the very beginning. Um, so, uh, and that is this. People oftentimes hear the term immaculate conception. And what is the first thing people think of? Uh, uh, people, especially folks who either are not Catholic or actually especially people who are Catholic, uh, who were uh, raised Catholic, and who are just, they, 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 this, this is a really great way to, uh, to trip up uh, folks you know who are cradle Catholics. You know, ask them what the Immaculate Conception is and, and, and find out what their response is. Because chances are they will say, oh, yeah, of course, the Immaculate Conception, that's, that's the birth of Jesus. Or that's the uh, that's that's when Mary conceived Jesus in the womb when the uh, Holy Spirit overshadowed her and uh, Jesus was no no it's so funny how many how, just how many Catholics believe 
that the that phrase, the Immaculate Conception, pertains to the to the conception of Jesus in the womb of Mary. That is not the case. And yet, again and again and again, at least at least I again and again and again hear so many cradle Catholics uh, mistakenly believing that the Immaculate Conception refers to the conception of Jesus Christ in the womb of Mary. That is not the case. When we're referring to the birth of Christ, we refer to it as the virgin birth because we know that it is also an official de fide teaching of the church that Mary was a virgin before, during, and after the birth of Jesus Christ. And that is a de fide doctrinal dogmatic teaching of the church. It is a dogma. Um, um, but the virgin, the virgin birth of our Lord Jesus Christ is, completely, is a completely different thing from the Immaculate Conception. Now, it is true that the Immaculate Conception uh, was necessary in order for Our Lady to give birth to our Lord because she would be, she had been chosen by God to be the instrument that he would use uh, to bring Christ into the world. That Christ chose God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all three persons of the Most Holy Trinity, um, chose the Blessed Virgin Mary to be the instrument by which the eternal word, the second person of the most holy trinity, the pre-incarnate logos, would descend into the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary and he would take his true authentic human nature from a true human person, his mother Mary. But it was also necessary that that human nature be... Well, we know from St. Paul that he was like us in all things except sin. So that was the one thing. And in order for Our Lady to hand on a, a true human nature, she had to be truly human herself, and in order for her to hand on a spotless, um, immaculate human nature, she too had to be spotless and immaculate. Um, you cannot give what you do not have, essentially, is what it boils down to. And unless Mary herself was spotless and completely untouched by completely and wholly preserved from the least stain of sin, she would not have been capable of passing on that immaculate, sinless nature that she did pass on to our Lord. So we, I said I would begin with the official definition. So let's start with that. This is, uh, again, from the papal document Ineffabilis Deus, uh, from 1854, December 8, 1854. Um, it's an apostolic constitution of Pius IX. Uh, and Pius IX, if I'm not mistaken, is blessed. I believe he was beatified. And um, so this section is the definition. Wherefore, in humility and fasting, we unceasingly offered our private prayers as well as the public prayers of the church to God, the Father, through his Son, that we would deign to direct and strengthen our mind by the power of the Holy Spirit. In like manner, did we implore the help of the entire heavenly host, as we ardently invoked the paraclete. Accordingly, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, for the honor of the holy and undivided Trinity, for the glory and adornment of the Virgin Mother of God, for the exaltation of the Catholic faith, and for the furtherance 
of the Catholic religion, by the authority of Jesus Christ our Lord, of the blessed apostles Peter and Paul, and by our own, we declare, pronounce, and define that the doctrine which holds that the most blessed Virgin Mary in the first instance of her of, in the first instance of her conception by a singular grace and privilege granted by Almighty God in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the human race, was preserved free from all stain of original sin, is a doctrine revealed by God and therefore to be, to be believed firmly and constantly by all the faithful. Hence, if anyone shall dare, which God forbid, to think otherwise than as has been defined by us, let him know and understand that he is condemned by his own judgment, that he has suffered shipwreck in the faith, that he has separated from the unity of the church, and that, furthermore, by his own action, he incurs the penalties established by the law if he should dare to express in words or in writing or by any other outward means the errors he thinks in his heart. So that is the official declaration by Pius IX, the blessed, oh, blessed Pius IX. So now that's a loaded, it's a loaded piece right there in and of itself, and we could, and we will pick that apart uh, in in its various pieces. But let's let's begin uh, at the beginning. Um, as I spoke last week, I explained how um, there there had been up until this proclamation, somewhat of a um, theological back and forth as to which of the Marian prerogatives was the most foundational and essential in terms of giving rise to the rest. And it really boiled down to two. And theologians chose one or the other in terms of, you know, uh, I'm, when I say theologians, I mean Orthodox theologians. Uh, and um, there's a marvelous, marvelous book I highly, highly recommend to anyone and everyone. It's The Mother of the Savior by Father Reginald Garagou Lagrange. And, um, and he talks about this very issue. And basically, uh, Theologians, Catholic theologians, basically came to an agreement that it would either it would ha it would have either been Mary's divine maternity as the foundational um, prerogative, or Mary's um, fullness of grace, uh, which was a consequence of her immaculate conception. So those were the two, and you can see how they are both. They are both immensely profound, um, whether you know, Mary, the mother of God, which is just absolutely astounding, or Mary conceived without the least stain of sin um, wholly untouched and full of grace. That's just astounding. I mean, what is grace? Grace is the divine life of God, participation in the divine life of God. But it, it, that she is full of every conceivable grace that she has been entrusted. Not only is she personally uh, imbued with uh, the, the, to the point where Maximilian, St. Maximilian Colby refers to the Blessed Virgin Mary as the quasi-incarnation of the Holy Spirit, that is absolutely astounding. And that's something we'll get into later as well. Uh, another, a, a third um, uh, resource that I'll be using tonight will be another marvelous, marvelous, amazing book 
um, by Father uh, Mantu Bonami, who is a, a Dominican preacher, a Dominican father, and um, and the book is entitled The Immaculate Conception and the Holy Spirit, The Marian Teachings of St. Maximilian Kolbe. And this book really, or I should say the thesis of this book is fleshing out St. Maximilian Kolbe's understanding of Mary as the quasi-incarnate uh, as the Holy, uh, Holy Spirit having a quasi incarnated himself in the Blessed Virgin Mary, and with an emphasis on the word quasi, because the Holy Mary is not an incarnation of the Holy Spirit. We're not we're not divinizing the Blessed Virgin Mary. And as I said last week, um, Saint Louis de Montfort makes it very clear. You know, Saint Louis de Montfort, uh, who is considered he and, and Maximilian Kolbe are considered the two of the greatest contemporary uh, champions of, of, of Marian devotion and Mariology. And, um, they have contributed so much to um, our understanding of the role of the Blessed Virgin Mary in our times. Um, and in large part, it had to do with the fact that it was, it was so necessary for the church to establish the absolute primacy of Jesus Christ and to work through all of the Christological issues and teachings, uh, to work through the Trinity, to hammer out Christology, to hammer out the unbelievable truths regarding the Most Holy Trinity, the, 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 the triune God. Um, it would have been very easy uh, for people to mistake the Blessed Virgin Mary for a God, uh, precisely because she is so full of grace. But, as we said last week, and, and this, is, this always holds true, um, Mary is a creature. Mary is a creature, and as a creature, she is finite and limited. Whereas God, as the creator, being comprised of three distinct persons, yet those three persons are truly one in their divine nature. They are so perfectly united and their bond of love is so real and so perfect ontologically and metaphysically that it is absolutely necessary that we state and understand that God is one. And, 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 and while we have an authentic distinction of persons, there is no distinction, uh, there is no separation of nature, there is no. Uh, they they are truly one. It's it, it's it's. You can use the psychological model of God, where you have God the Father from all eternity, bringing Himself into existence, causing His own existence. God revealed His own name. Uh, at, at the burning bush to Moses as I am. I am he who is. I am he who must be. I am the sole necessary being. Uh, God, you know, when, when Moses asked, what do, who do I tell them sent me? Uh, he says, tell them, I am sent you. I am who am. I am he who is. I am he who cannot not be. I am he whose existence is necessary. I am the sole necessary being. None of us is necessary. It is not necessary that you exist or that I exist or that the universe exists. It is not necessary for anything to exist. It is, however, necessary, absolutely, unconditionally, for God to exist. And ultimately, that is the answer to the great metaphysical question posed by William James and so many other philosophers, 
why is there something rather than nothing? And the answer to that question is simply this. Because God is. That's the answer to that great, seemingly vexing philosophical question. Why is something as opposed to nothing? That's the answer. God is. God forever has been and forever and always will be. God cannot not be. And for as long as God is and, has, and he always has been and always will be, that is the answer to the question, why is there something as opposed to nothing? Because God is. And even if the entire universe were to, uh, say, we buy into the theory of expanding and collapsing and expanding and collapsing, say eventually one day the whole universe just literally collapses in upon itself uh, to the point where it, it, it just absolute entropy. Um, what then? Well, it, it doesn't change a thing in terms of the triune God and his existence from all eternity and his continued existence for all eternity. Nothing that happens in the material or the spiritual world will affect God in any way, shape, or form because God is absolutely simple and immutable. He's unchanging. God has absolutely no potency. God is pure act. He has no potency because to have potency means to be to have the potential to to change. For instance, uh, and this is this really presupposes an understanding of Thomistic philosophy. Um, Thomistic philosophy uh, draws heavily on the philosophy of Aristotle, and Aristotle teaches that he makes this distinction between act and potency. Um, when you have act, a thing that is in act is when a thing is whatever it is. Uh, if a thing is in potency, uh, there is the potential for that thing that is in act to undergo change. For instance, I am in potency with regard to learning Russian. I don't speak Russian. I don't write Russian. I can't understand Russian. But I could sit down and learn the language. I could learn to speak Russian. I could learn to write in Russian. I could learn to understand some... Granted, it would be at a very elementary, very, very remedial level. <laughs> I can assure you of that. Um, however, I am in act... I'm sorry, I am in potency with regard to, the, with regard to speaking the Russian language... Uh, and that simply means that I have the potential to learn Russian. Um, God has no potency. God is pure act. Because if God had the potential to become something that he is already not, then, or, or to acquire an a, a attribute, uh, that, that, would, that, would, that would mean that there is some in perfection in God. And clearly, God is necessarily perfect. Um, um, God is the ultimate standard by which all things can be and are measured. Um, that is actually one of the arguments for God's existence, the perfection of God. Um, the fact that we can look to things and say, well, that's good, but this is better. And although this is better than Although B is better than A, C is the best of them all. The fact that we can say good, better, and best and make comparisons ultimately comes from the reality that God is the sum of all perfections and that he is pure act and there is no potency in God. Anyway, probably completely lost you. Um, so I will get back to the Immaculate Conception. Um, we read the definition. The, so we talked about how theologians were kind of going back and forth, which, and, and, and this definition really uh, helps contribute 
to the understanding, and we also have, uh, we, we know that it, it really boils down to Mary's ultimate vocation as, uh, or God, God the Father calling Our Lady to, from all eternity, to be the Mother of God. And it, it is for that purpose. It is at the service of her divine maternity and her vocation to give the eternal word, his human nature, and to give him an immaculate human nature, it is for this purpose that Mary is immaculately conceived. It is for, so the immaculate conception is truly an amazing prerogative of Our Lady, but it is at, ultimately it is at the service of Mary's divine maternity, her motherhood of Jesus Christ. So it is the, cent- the second central Marian doctrine. Um, and as we have just discussed, we, not only do we have the theology in Scripture, or at least this, what we call the seeds, the seeds of this doctrine in sacred Scripture, and we also have the, the tradition and the, the writing of the church fathers, but we also have the added bonus and the added certainty of an infallible definition. And that is given by Pope Pius IX in 1854. And and that is the proclamation that Mary was indeed immaculately conceived and that she was conceived without being touched by the least stain of original sin. Uh, so let's take a look at the scriptural passages that, uh, that, that provide us with the doctrinal seeds of this, um, of ultimately the seeds that give rise to the fullness of this, this doctrine. Uh, for, and I'm, uh, here I'm going to be reading from Dr. Mark Mirabali's book, Introduction to Mary, um, The Heart of Marian Doctrine and Devotion. This is page 37, um, under the Immaculate Conception. From sacred scripture, we have at least two passages of the Bible that present the implicit seed of the revealed truth of Mary's Immaculate Conception. And the first of these is Genesis 3.15. And Mirabali states, After Adam and Eve committed the original sin, God addresses Satan, who is represented by the serpent, quote, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall crush your head, and you shall lie in wait for his heel. Since the seed of the woman is Jesus Christ, who is to crush Satan victoriously in the redemption, then the woman must, in fact, refer to Mary, the mother of the Redeemer. The word enmity, which is rich in meaning in this passage in particular, signifies that she is in opposition to, that our Lord Jesus is in opposition to sin, and that Mary is in opposition to the serpent or Satan. The enmity established between the seed of the woman, who is Jesus, and the seed of the serpent, which is sin, and all the evil angels and human beings, is in absolute and complete opposition because there is absolute and complete opposition between Jesus and all evil. In other words, the seed of the woman and the seed of Satan have to be in complete and total opposition to each other as depicted in the term enmity. And that's spelled, I I don't pronounce it very well, spelled E-N-M-I-T-Y. So so there is diametric opposition here. Um, Absolute opposition. Um, 
Continuing on, further in the passage, we see the identical God-given opposition or enmity given and proclaimed by God between the woman, Mary, and the serpent, Satan. Mary is given the same absolute and perpetual opposition to Satan as Jesus possesses in relation to sin. It is for this reason that Mary could not have received a fallen nature as a result of original sin. Any participation in the effects of original sin would place the mother of Jesus in at least partial participation with Satan and sin, thereby destroying the complete God-given opposition as revealed in Genesis chapter 3. So, Mary could not have given birth to our Lord if she had been in any way, shape, or form touched by the original sin. It was essential that she be conceived without the least stain of original sin. It was absolutely essential to the integrity of our Lord's perfect, spotless, and sinless human nature, that Mary herself be spotless and sinless. And when you think about that, that makes perfect sense. Um, you know, it, it would actually be, if, 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 if we did not have, you know, if, if for some hypothetical you know, hypothetically speaking, if the Immaculate Conception were not defined as it is, if it were not the case that Mary was immaculately conceived, it would be kind of difficult to wrap our minds around how our Lord would receive in his nature. I mean, the whole concept of parenting, of, of, of you know, a father, a uh, father, a father and a mother, uh, sp spouses coming together uh, to unite themselves as one body in the in the physical uh, ratification, if you will, of the of the marital contract and the the, the holy sacrament of matrimony. The two become one uh, in every in every conceivable manner. Uh, the two become one emotionally. They, the two become one uh, spiritually. The two become one physically. Um, they become one flesh. And that reality is brought to its highest physical manifestation in the conjugal union, which, which gives rise to a third person who is the personification of the love between those two persons. So the, the two, in becoming one, become three because love is fruitful and love is fecund. And that's absolutely beautiful. Now, of course, in, in Mary's situation, we, we, know, we, we understand fully that it was the Holy Spirit who descended upon Mary. The Holy Spirit will, will come upon you. The power of the, of the Most High will overshadow you. Hence, the child to be born will be called Son of God. Um, when Mary asked, well, how can this be? I am a virgin. I, uh, I do not know man. Um, Mary was legitimately trying to understand how this would come to pass given the reality of her, of her situation, um, as opposed to Zechariah, uh, who, when he was told that uh, his wife would, would give birth uh, in her old age, and, and uh, um, he, he, he also questioned, but his question did not spring from a genuine, sincere curiosity, you know, respectful curiosity, um, how can this be? Uh, his was his 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 questioning was more a consequence of a doubt. Uh, uh, he, I think I think he laughed, and and 
um, in the presence of the angel, like, ha, yeah, yeah, right, that'll be the day. That'll be the day. Yeah, hell, hell will freeze over before that happens. Now, the, that, that type of thinking uh, in the presence of an archangel uh, doesn't tend to go down very well. So if you ever are, uh, I mean, chances this will not happen to you, but uh, you probably will not be visited by an archangel in your lifetime. You may. You may. Actually, I bet the one person listening to this show will indeed receive a visitation from the archangel just because of what I said. <laughs> that's, uh, that's my, uh, God, has a, God has a wonderful way of, um, uh, it's long story, won't even go there. Won't touch that with a 10-foot pole. Anyway, uh, so getting back to this incredibly beautiful doctrine Um, The opposition between Jesus and sin, and this is, again, Mirabali speaking here, the opposition between Jesus and sin is paralleled by the opposition between the woman, Mary, and the serpent, Satan. Again, this tells us that Mary could not participate in the fallen nature because that would mean participating at least partially in the domain of sin, a reality to which God gave Mary complete opposition. Okay. So that, I think that makes perfect sense. Um, now, moving into f- further scripture in the New Testament, uh, further scriptural seeds for the Immaculate Conception in the New Testament can be found in the Gospel of Luke, uh, chapter 1, verse 28 in particular where the Archangel Gabriel speaks to the Blessed Virgin Mary, appears to her and says, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. This is the angelic salutation. The angel is greeting the Blessed Virgin. Um, And the angel actually substitutes Mary's name with the phrase, full of grace. So instead of saying, Hail, Hail Mary, he says, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Um, a person's name, when you know a person's name, that person ceases to be a stranger. You know something about that person. And um, oftentimes, um, well, we know that uh, certainly our, our, our last names, our, 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 um, our surnames, um, oftentimes they, they tell us something about the person. For instance, um, all the names that end with, with, with son, like, John, like Johnson or Thompson or um, Robertson, um, you actually have there a person being referred to as the son of John, hence that is John's son. Uh, uh, we, we, oh, the, oh that, that, that young lad over there, that's, uh, that's Tom's son. So that's, uh, that's, his, that's uh, Frank, Tom's son. So he gets the name Frank Thompson. Um, uh, that's, so the whole litany of names uh, in, in the, well, at least the, the anglicized names that end in son, uh, that is how they came into existence. So being the child of a certain person, uh, we can be named after our parents or the, or the, the, the person who is our father. Um, surnames uh, originate from uh, places. Um, for instance, Louis de Montfort. Uh, St. Louis-Marie Grignon de Montfort. Um, uh, and uh, there are many instances of, of people who have last names that are the names of the places that they were born or raised or lived. And um, that was true of, uh, of uh, countless saints. Um, it was true of Louis de Montfort, uh, it was true of, I believe it was true of Thomas Aquinas. Uh, 
Thomas D. Aquino uh, in Italy. I believe it was true of, uh, so you could be born, named after the place where you're born. Um, sometimes physical traits and characteristics are used to, um, to give rise to a person's uh, last name. Um, uh, my name, my last name, Brunel, is, is uh, it's interesting because I am primarily, I'm 82% Italian and, uh, let's see, so I'm, I'm primarily Italian, but my, my last name is French, um, even though, well, actually, my last name is both French and Italian uh, in its spelling, the exact same spelling, it's B-R-U-N-E-L-L-E. And there are Italians with the name Brunel, and they probably pronounce it Brunelli. And there are, are French folks who have the name Brunel. And it just so happens that my father's father, who has no Italian in him whatsoever, is, um, is, um, the, is the one who passed on the name that I carry, although my other three grandparents are all uh, 100% Italian. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. Um, uh, my mother is full-blooded. And um, so, so Brunel, I found out, comes from uh, the word brown, really, the color brown. And that could have pertained to the dark hair that runs in my family. We all have very, very dark brown hair that looks black, actually. It's, it's uh, dark, dark hair. We all have brown eyes um, <clears throat> on my Italian side. And even on my grandfather's side, he had dark features as well, even though he was not Italian. Um, and he was the one who had the name. So <clears throat> clearly it must have been his family. Um, so he must have been uh, probably, uh, I don't remember too much about him, and he was quite old. Uh, when I was very young, so didn't get to know him very well at all. Just have very limited memories of him. But um, it is possible that he uh, lived amongst some fair-skinned individuals, and that he was the darkest amongst them, or, or what have you. Um, who knows? Uh, or where he got the name? But so all of these. Now, why am I talking about names? What does that have to do with? Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the fact that she was immaculately conceived in order to pass on a spotless, immaculate human nature to our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, because uh, she was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Hence, the child to be born will be called the Son of God. And so, and we know that Jesus' name the name Jesus, or Yeshua, in uh, Hebrew, uh, means uh, God saves. So the name Jesus means God saves. Christ is a title. It is uh, the Greek version of, um, of Messiah, which means anointed one. Um, Christos. Uh, and um, so you have... God saves, and uh, and and that He is the Messiah. All of that, all that information that, that Jesus Christ is the Savior of humanity, that um, that He is the long-awaited, long-expected, long-promised Messiah who would save His people. All of that is contained in the name Jesus Christ, that he was the one chosen by God the Father and anointed for this mission. All of that is contained in his very name. Um, and Mary, um, and this is really a beautiful, beautiful insight. Um, uh, Maximilian Colby talks about how Our Lady takes on now, of course, in, 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 in when we think about matrimony and, and the sacrament of matrimony and um, the tradition of, of the, the bride taking the name of her husband um, in many cultures where the bride takes the name of her husband. Um, my wife 
uh, took my name and and it's um I think it's a, I personally think it's a beautiful beautiful custom and I think it's in, in beautiful accordance with um, the marvelous traditions uh, that we have that have given that have come into existence through uh, Western civil throughout Western civilization and um, It's fascinating to to think that the Blessed Virgin Mary took the name. We know well, we know that Mary has a unique relationship with each person of the Holy Trinity. Mary is clearly she's the mother of the Son. Well, first of all, she's the daughter of the Father. Mary is the daughter of the Father. Um, like us, just as we are sons and daughters, adopted sons and daughters of God the Father, so too is Mary an adopted child of God through, with, and in her son, Jesus Christ. And, and moreover, it, it, was, it is through the, as, as it states in the, in the document, it is through the, um, let me see if I can find exactly where it is. By a singular grace and privilege granted by Almighty God in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, Mary was as much in, in need of redemption as any of us were and are. So even though Mary was the mother of Jesus Christ and preceded Jesus Christ temporally, even though she came before, obviously she had to come before Jesus, uh, if, if she was going to give birth to Jesus, um, uh, as a, in his in his human state, um, she of course would have to precede our Lord um, um, temporally. Um, however, and, and that and that became a, a very significant theological issue, um, and and theologians debated this back and forth. Well, you know. Uh, it, Ultimately, to make a long story short, it was Blessed John Duns Scotus, a brilliant Franciscan, a brilliant Franciscan philosopher and theologian who um, basically solved the dilemma of how to understand Mary's fullness of grace, Mary's immaculate conception uh, despite the fact that she was the mother of Jesus Christ, who had not yet been born, had not yet lived his life, had not yet redeemed humanity. Um, and it's, it's interesting because people make a, such a big, big issue of, of this, and they praise Dun Scotus, and, and, I, and I think, and I, I do too, I think it's, it's wonderful that he... Uh, you know, was able to um, solve this issue. I'm kind of, I'm kind of a little bit curious as to why it was such an issue. To be honest, um, and th- this is just, I'm just being very honest. I, I, you know, he explains how Jesus Christ, being, you know, being the God Man, uh, being Yes, he, he, yes, it is true that Mary temporally preceded giving birth to Christ, uh, but ultimately we know that, uh, that when Jesus, the divine person, uh, who was uh, prior, prior to the uh, incarnation, he, was, uh, he, he only possessed one nature, and that, of course, that nature was, of course, divine. Uh, and, and when he descended into the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, that is when, 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 the, when, the, when the Spirit of the Lord, um, Spirit of the Lord will overshadow you, and the power, um, power of God will overshadow you. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and the power of the Lord will overshadow you. The child to be born will be called the Son of God. Um, we know that Jesus Christ, as a man, as, as a uh, 
as a man would necessarily um, have to come after the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, however, uh, because, because he was truly divine as well, Jesus was 100% human and 100% divine. And in his divinity, um, and because there was that aspect of himself that was outside of space-time, outside of the confines of space and time, um, it, it, it's, I, 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 I guess, I guess, I don't know, I guess I, to me, it's, it's intuitive that, that the graces that Christ won in the redemption, even though the redemption took place in time, um, even though Christ had, had yet to actually endure the passion, um, it makes sense that, that any, any kind of gift that had been given to anybody, uh, any human person, uh, prior to Christ's coming on earth, prior to Christ's life, death, and resurrection and ascension into heaven in the entire Paschal mystery by which we are saved. Um, you know, for, uh, for instance, when Mary visited her cousin Elizabeth, and it states that in Scripture that the Holy Spirit, uh, that Mary greeted her cousin Elizabeth, um, she entered into Zechariah's house. She greeted Elizabeth. And at that moment, uh, the child in her womb leapt for joy and was sanctified in the womb. And, and Elizabeth herself was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, in order for any of that to happen, that had to come through the merits of Christ. And all of, the, all of the numerous instances in the Old Testament where the Holy Spirit was falling upon people, uh, all of those manifestations, uh, all, of the, all, of, all of the graces that were given prior to the life, death, resurrection, and ascension, prior to the Paschal mystery of Christ, ultimately would have to be attributed to the Paschal mystery which had yet to occur in each and every instance in the Old Testament. So I, I'm kind of surprised that people make such a big deal about the quote-unquote solution of Duns Scotus. And I don't mean to like, belittle Duns Scotus, I'm sure. I know I, I took a class for Franciscan um, Traditions and philosophy, and, and I, I it was a, a brilliant class, amazing class, and and Scotus is, is a truly a, a brilliant thinker and and, a, and and philosopher, but I guess I guess um, I guess I was just a little bit surprised that that it was such a big issue. Um, I don't know, but um, that's pretty much the, all the time we have for this evening. Um, I hope that uh, I was able to uh, convey some some truths uh, through. I hope the whole. I should say I hope that the Holy Spirit was able to push me aside enough to to use me as as a broken crayon is in His hands. Um, and I would just ask that we. Stop and thank the Lord for this time together. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to reflect upon the marvelous truths that are contained in your most holy and sacred scripture. This compilation of marvelous books written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, dictated by the Spirit to the sacred authors, to convey the fullness of the truth which you promised uh, would come about as a consequence of the apostles uh, in sharing time in the upper room with Our Lady in the proto cenacle of Jerusalem and to not return to their, to not return to Nazareth until they had prayed 
uh, for the Holy Spirit, uh, as our Lord promised they would be, uh, that he would send his Spirit and who would lead them into the fullness of the truth and would help them to recall all of the things that he taught them. Um, and we know that, that after those nine days of very intense, intense prayer, that the Holy Spirit came firstly as a gust of wind, uh, a sound like, like, a, like a, a, a loud, strong wind filled the house where they were staying. And there were tongues as of fire which separated and came to rest on the heads of each one of them. And they, were, they began to praise the Lord. And, and there were people living, people from everywhere in the world at that time uh, who, who had gathered, Jews from all over the world who had gathered in Jerusalem. Um, and they were in awe because each one of them heard the apostles praising the Lord, giving thanks and praise and glorifying the Lord in his own native tongue, each one of them. And they were all from different regions, different countries, different areas gathered together in Jerusalem. How is it that each of us, speaking different languages, hears them speaking in our own native tongue? So, and, and, and the Holy Spirit literally transformed these, these fearful, timid men who, who were hiding behind locked doors for fear that they too, like Christ, their master, would be dragged out and, and crucified uh, for being his disciples, for being his followers. They were afraid. These, were, these men had just undergone a, a serious trauma, um, that, that, that rocked uh, their faith uh, and, and tested it in a way that they never expected it to be tested. And so they gathered together in, the, in this upper room with the Blessed Mother, and they prayed and they prayed. And Our Lady, even then, even then, in her role as spiritual mother, of, 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 of particularly of the Apostles, uh, her well beloved sons, but she is she's a she's the mother of every single human person who ever has, has lived, who is alive and, and will live. And she, as the mediatrix of all graces, obtained the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit ever in the history of humanity. We turn to you now, Holy Mother Mary, and we give and consecrate ourselves to you without any exception, holding nothing whatsoever back for ourselves. We give ourselves entirely and completely to you that you might use us to bring about the triumph of your most immaculate heart in the world and in all souls. We consecrate and give the entirety of our lives, our, our entire life, death, and all eternity for you to dispose of in accordance with your designs of salvation in this hour of decision that weighs upon the world. Uh, please transform us and obtain for us a second superabundant outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the form of a new second Pentecost to prepare us to be transformed to receive our Lord who is coming again. Amen. May the Lord bless us, protect us from all evil, and bring us to life everlasting. Amen. Thank you, and God bless. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.